Listening to the uh, newly elected uh, Italian Prime Minister, uh, Giorgio Maloney, talk, what you have, first of all, is a certain type of rhetorical subtlety. She, they say yes, but we say no. And so as this lilt builds, you begin to see that there's an agenda here. She knows how to lay out her vision. She knows how to contrast it. So she is, in her own way, you know, we sometimes say the left, the left is a dividing force. She's a dividing force, but she's dividing against the left. Or she's trying to put it differently. She's unifying Italy against the left. And, um, and um, what a contrast with so many of the kind of conservatives and Republicans in this country who are just such lifeless duds. I mean, I think of, uh, just think of someone like McConnell or McCarthy, who half-heartedly put out, now that we're just two months from the election, here is our agenda, we're going to be doing this and we're going to be doing that. First of all, it's not even clear that you can believe them. Uh, second of all, this agenda is nothing more. All they've done is go back to recycle papers from the last election or perhaps even from 25 years ago. Uh, and this is a kind of a warmed over agenda. Yeah, this time we're really going to be serious. Look, we, we don't have an alternative. We have the Republican Party. We have to work through the Republican Party. But all I'm saying is that we could sure use some more Georgia Maloney's over here. Now, I want to talk about how uh, Giorgio Maloney's victory in Italy uh, is ushering in a second crisis of Marxism. Um, and here's what I mean. Well, I'll start with a little data point. Um, and this is a, a graph that I saw on uh, one of these websites. Working class Southern Italy seems to have completely abandoned the Italian left. And it shows a graph of the uh, Italian left success in southern Italy, which is, by the way, the left wing of Italy. Italy, by the way, um, has had the strongest communist party in Europe for many decades. Let's think back to the Italian communist Antonio Gramsci was, of course, of course, Italian. Uh, and the Italian left has always been strong. It still is strong, but it's just uh, the right has proven to be stronger. But the um, the, the the movement of working class people away from the left, just as in this country, we're seeing working class people moving away from the left and from the Democrats, a very important, perhaps the most important political trend of our time. Now, the crisis of Marxism. There was a crisis of Marxism at the turn of the night, at the end of the 19th century um, and the beginning of the 20th century. Basically, Marxists saw that the working class revolution that they were hoping for and that Marx had predicted would happen inevitably was not happening. And so the, um, the left realized that they need a different kind of Marxism to keep Marxism alive. How are you going to produce this proletarian revolution? And their answer was, uh, we need to do two things. First of all, we need a professional class of revolutionaries. This was kind of Lenin's solution, um, that the working class is not going to revolt in Russia, but the revolutionaries could establish a kind of communist dictatorship of the proletariat, and that's what they did. Now, in the West, led by Gramsci, the left moved in a different direction, a direction that only came to, really came to full fruition in the 1960s and has continued ever since, which is let's take over the institutions of culture. Let's take over the universities. Let's take over the schools. Let's try to infiltrate the churches. Let's try to infiltrate big business. Let's try to take over even the military. And so this project, let's call it cultural Marxism, was the solution to the failure of economic Marxism. Since economic Marxism didn't seem to be strong enough to produce this true fissure between the bourgeois and the proletariat, let's use cultural Marxism as a weapon. And identity politics was born out of that. It was born out of cultural Marxism. Let's not just emphasize the economic divide. Let's emphasize the racial divide and the gender divide and the transgender divide. And I think what's interesting is that Giorgio Maloney in, in Italy basically said, all right, you want to play on the cultural field? Let's play. And so her approach has been to fight largely on the cultural front. Uh, she hasn't been primarily doing battle on the economic front. Now, there are a couple of her adjoining parties, including uh, Silvio Berlusconi's party, that are more, you could say, traditional conservatives emphasize uh, economic interests and low tax rates and privatization and so on. But Georgia Maloney's campaign has been basically, no, we are basically going to fight over God, 
We're going to fight over family. We're going to fight over morality, and we're going to fight over country. And and that's the kind of uh, four prongs of the Maloney campaign. And what she's shown is you can beat cultural Marxism at its own game. You don't have to be on the defensive about identity politics. You don't have to change the topic. You don't have to say, well, what really matters is inflation. No, inflation matters, but immigration matters. And immigration, of course, a critical issue for Maloney, a critical issue for Republicans, as I think Republicans now realize here in this country. And so what what I think is coming about, and it's going to be delightful to see it to reach its conclusion, is not just the smashing of economic Marxism, which has now occurred over more than a century, but also the smashing of its replacement, which is cultural Marxism as well.